Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Shafiq, and I would like to welcome all of you in this video session. Today, we'll be talking about the second part of Pile Foundation. Uh, so in our first uh, part, we already talked about different types of files and how to find out the tip resistance. Today, we'll be talking about uh, here is the outline of my presentation. Uh, so you can see we'll be talking about frictional resistance in sand and in clay. And then basically, we'll also talk about the bearing capacity of group piles, group efficiency, settlement of piles, elastic settlement, and consolidation settlement. That's about it. But the main part would be actually the frictional resistance in sand and clay, okay? Then we'll talk a little bit about the bearing capacity of group piles because pile, many cases work as a group because we put a cap on top of the pile, okay? So we have also talked like group efficiency, whether a group is efficient or not, and then the settlement of piles, and we will include definitely elastic settlement and consolidation settlement, okay? Now, if you think about, let's say, the equation for frictional resistance is QS equal to P into L into FAV. FAV is the frictional resistance per square feet area of the contact surface, okay? Where P is the perimeter, L is the length. So perimeter into length, that's basically the area in which the uh, frictional force will be working. If I show you here, let's say this is my pile. So the frictional force will be working along that surface, right? So what's the area of the surface? That's basically P multiplied by L. So if I uh, take this one off, then basically this is my surface, okay? This is P and this is L. Now the biggest problem is like not, the, not to finding out the P or L, the biggest problem is how to find out the frictional coefficient uh, per square uh, area, unit area of, of the pile surface. That depends on many things, like the, definitely the type of soil, consolidation, how com compact are that, what type of pile we are trying to um, install. Is it a drive-in pile or it's a um, board or jetted pile? So, so many things depends on that, okay? Now you can see the nature of variation of F in the field is approximately as the figure shown here. So let me make that one a little smaller here. So if this is your pile, then we see that the frictional coefficient, they change from zero to a certain amount like L prime and then remain same here. That's basically in sand. We are talking about the frictional resistance in sand now, okay? So the unit skin friction increase with depth more or less linearly to a certain depth that remains constant thereafter. Why this one is zero here? Because when you drive a pile, then basically a lot of disturbance you know, at the top of the surface. I mean, so you can see there is like movement here. So what happens is it, it's not that tight, you know, like near the surface. So we don't see that much friction there, but as you go down and down, then you will see at a certain depth, this one will achieve a frictional, you know, resistance and that will remain constant throughout the depth of the pile. Now we see most of the cases, this one varies from 15 to 20 pile diameters, okay? And a 
conservative estimate would be L is equal to 15 D. So from here to here, that's actually 15 D increases from zero to here and then remain constant. Okay. So if this is the case, then let's move forward and see that how this one will, how we can find out that F from there. So you can see from zero, Z equal to zero to L prime, this one changes like K sigma over um, overburden, this is your effective stress tan delta prime. What does it mean? Delta prime is the friction angle between soil and the surface of the pile, okay? This is your overburden pressure and K is basically your effective earth pressure coefficient, okay? Now, from Z to L, you can see is from Z, from L prime to L means like from here to here, actually that remains same. So your F remains same, which is your F at Z equal to L prime, okay? So basically from here to here, your F value is kind of constant. It's not gonna change that much. Okay, so as I already described that one, that which part is which part. So that's basically one of the most important factor would be how to find out this K, okay? Effective earth pressure coefficient. And if we see, then basically, the unit friction depends on how much soil displacement occurred during the pile installation, right? You know, high displacement piles, you also know low displacement pile. And for board piles, actually there is no displacement at all. So if the tip of the pile is closed, then basically they have to displace a lot of soil from there, like let's say uh, wooden piles. Okay, they will displace like the concrete, precast concrete pile, they will just displace a lot of uh, soil. So we call that one high displacement pile, right? Low displacement pile means like which one? Like the pipe pile, okay? So they won't displace that much soil, but they will displace a little bit. On the other hand, if you make a hole and then put the concrete there, this is not going to displace at all. So the friction depends on like how much soil has been displaced. Now you can see your K naught or K value actually like in the other equation is equal to one minus sine phi for board soil. And then one minus sine phi to 1.4 into one minus sine phi. That's for low displacement pile. And uh, for high displacement, file that varies from K naught to 1.8 K naught, okay? The value of, uh, of your uh, friction angle between the soil and pile that varies from 0.5 phi to 0.8 phi, okay? According to Munsur and Hunter, they gave you like other relationship that if you have H pile, which is basically a high displacement pile, then basically your K has to be 1.65. Still pipe pile, which is low displacement pile, that then your K has to be 1.26. And precast concrete pile, which is also high displacement pile, then your K has to be 1.5, okay? Now move forward. This one is coil and castio method, okay? The frictional coefficient in sand. Coil and castio uh, is saying that basically they gave you a chart from where you can find out your K, okay? So they are saying that the same equation here, but you can see here is K sigma average prime tan delta prime PL. 
So that's basically the same equation over there. Only thing here is your average effective overburden pressure. That's you have to find out, okay? And then you can see, you can plug that value here. And he is saying that your delta prime is basically 0.8 phi prime. And he gave you this chart where you can find out your K based on your frictional angle of the soil as well as the embedment ratio, L by D, okay? So we'll see um, example problem that how we can use that one to find out our frictional resistance. So Mayerhoff suggests that the average unit frictional resistance, he is trying to make a relationship of your FAV based on your SPT value. SPT value means standard penetration test, which is also called the N number. So if you know your N60 values, then basically you can estimate what would be the friction, unit friction uh, for a driving piles, okay? For high displacement piles, FAV equal to 0 0.02 PA in 60. For low displacement pile, you can see FAV equal to 0 0.02. Actually, I made a mistake. This one has to be changed a little bit here. I'll fix that one in our... Um, uh, the PDF file, okay? Now you can see your N60 is the average value of standard penetration resistance and PA is the atmospheric pressure. You already know about that, which is 100 kPa or 2000 PSF, okay? And Broad also suggested that your average unit friction would be 0.224 PA and 60 to the power 0.29. So if you just plug that value in that equation, then basically you will find out the frictional resistance based on SPT value. There is another you know, uh, correlation between the frictional resistance in sand with the cone penetrometer test or CPT, okay? So let's move there, uh, here. So Nottingham and Sh Smartman, and Smartman 1978, they suggested that if you know the frictional resistance of the cone, then basically the friction uh, between the soil and the pile would be alpha prime a prime C. You usually measure that one directly with your cone penetrometer. Now, if you know your alpha prime, then basically you know your F here. So the total resistance would be the same equation here, P L into F. So if you change your F with alpha prime by F C, and this is your variation of alpha with L by D for electric cone and mechanical cone penetrometer as shown below. So basically this is the relationship here. If you know L by D ratio, you can find out your alpha prime, okay? You can see this is for, let's say for timber pile, this is for the steel pile, this is concrete pile, okay? So this one is from, um, uh, from the reference I talked about that, okay? Now let's move forward and try to see one of the examples. First of all, this one is saying, consider a 15 meter long concrete pile with a cross section of 0 0.045 meter and 0 0.045 meter, means like this is a square shaped pile, fully embedded in sand. For the sand, given unit weight is 17 kilonewton per meter cube and soil friction angle phi prime is 35 degree, estimate the frictional resistance QS for the pile 
use k equal to 1.3 and delta prime is equal to 0.8 phi prime. And B, also find out the frictional resistance based on Coel and Castillo method, okay? So let's see the solution here. First of all, we know that up to 15 D, this one will change from zero to a certain number. So what is my 15 D means like 6.75 meter because this is our D and this is 15. So this is 6.75 meter from at zero, z equal to zero, depth z equal to zero, you can see your overburden pressure is zero, so your f equal to zero. At z equal to 6.75, your overburden pressure would be gamma h, so h is 6.75, gamma is 17, so it's 114.75. Okay, so what would be my f at z equal to 6.75. So that's actually k uh, effective overburden stress 10 delta prime. So k is given 1.3. We just calculate 114.75 here. That's the effective overburden pressure multiplied by 10 into 0.8 phi prime. So we get 79.3 kilonewton per meter square. Okay. Every meter squared, they have 79.3 kilonewton friction. So the average value from z equal to zero to 6.75, that's actually zero plus these divided by two, so 39.7 kilonewton per meter square. So from zero to 6.75, the average value is 39.7. After 6.75 meter, actually the friction is constant. So average friction would be equal to the friction at 6.75, okay? So you can see this is the first part up to 15 D. And then here is actually 15 D to the rest of the pi. So we plug all those values here and we got 1,659 kilonewton, okay? Now let's move forward and see how we can find out based on Coil and Castillo method, okay? So for Coil and Castillo method, actually this is your equation here. So you have to find out your K first. So K is a function of L by D as well as your phi prime. So L by D is equal to 15 meter divided by 0.45, that's 33.3 and phi prime is 35 degree. Now, if you come here, draw a line uh, here, and then draw another line because this is your 35 degree. So that comes here and you can see the value of this one is approximately 0.93, right? This is 0.9 and this is 0.93. So you have to find that the average, you know, like overburden pressure. So at Z equal to zero, you see your overburden pressure is zero. At Z equal to 17, actually that would be 15, Z equal to 15 because the length of the pile is 15. So gamma H equal to 17 into 15, 17 is the unit weight of the soil. 15 is your H, so you have 255 kilonewton per meter square. So what's the average? Zero plus these divided by two. So zero at the top, 255 at the bottom. If you get the average, you get 127.5 kilonewton per meter square, okay? So if you plug that value in this equation, you already know 0.93 from here. This is your average overburden pressure, which is 127.5, 1028. 28 is 0 0.8 into 35, that's actually here. Then your P into L, perimeter is basically four into 0.45. As I said, this is a square and each side is 0.45. So four side is four into 
0.45, that's the perimeter and the total length is 15. So you get 2,380 kN. Now you can see that in the previous problem, actually uh, you got 1,660 around here, you got 2,380. That's a significant you know, change, right? So that's very common here because we don't have any mathematical derivation that how this one will behave. Every equation here is kind of empirical relationship based on what we see in the field, okay? So uh, you can expect this kind of difference in many other cases too. Now, frictional resistance in clay. How to find out the frictional resistance in clay? Once again, this is a very, very difficult because presence of several variables that cannot easily be quantified, okay? Because you are not going there, it's under the soil. You don't know, you know what's the variation of compaction how the soil is changing from every feet or many other factors too. You just make one borehole and try to understand the nature of soil from uh, one or two boreholes, right? But that doesn't tell you the actual picture uh, of the subsurface. So that's why this is basically very, very difficult, but we'll be talking about uh, most notable methods here, okay? So these are, you can see lambda method, alpha method, and beta method. These are the most common three methods to find out the frictional resistance in clay, okay? So let's try with one of each of them one by one. So first of all, lambda method based on the assumption that pile driving causes a passive lateral pressure around the soil of the pile, the average unit frictional resistance is FAV is equal to lambda. This is your average overburden pressure plus two CU. CU here is the weighted average of your uh, unconfined compression strength, okay? or undrained shear strength, okay? So this is the mean effective vertical stress for the entire length. So you can see here, they are taking two different parts here. One part, as you go down, this one increases, and this one actually a function of the layer that you were talking about. So this is cohesion between the soil and the pile represents the soil and uh, the cohesion between the soil and piles. This one represents like how tight, you know, like the pile is inside the soil, okay? Now, if you see here, uh, this value of lambda decreases with depth of penetration of the pile as shown in table 12.10. So this is your 12.10, they gave you the embedment length and this is your lambda here, okay? So if you know your embedment length, you can find out your lambda here. But try to remember that one, that this one is in meter. So if you have like, let's say 50 feet, you know, like uh, pile, then basically you have to convert that one to meter and then you can find out your lambda from here. Okay, and then the total frictional resistance QS equal to PLAV. If you know your FAV, you just plug that one in that equation, you can easily find out your uh, frictional resistance. So as I said earlier, that finding out that FAV is the most challenging part, okay? Now let's see that how we can find out this one and the weighted average of this one, okay? 
So if you see the soil here, the total length is L. This is one layer is L1, second layer is L2, third layer is L3, and the first layer has CE1, CU2, and CU3. So uh, let me uh, do this one first, the weighted average of the shear strain, that is CU1, L1, CU2, L2, CU3, L3 divided by L. That's basically the weighted average of the or mean undrained shear strength. Now, how can you find out the mean effective vertical stress? So you can see they draw the vertical stress diagram here. Okay, vertical stress diagram here. Now you can either get the average for this layer, average for this layer, or average for this layer, and take the average of the three or you can just do that one like the area here plus the area here plus the area here and then divide that one with l that's basically you will get the mean effective vertical stress okay so what would be the area here that would be these plus these divided by two multiplied by l okay what would be this one here? This plus this divided by two multiplied by this L. So when we are talking about this plus this divided by two, that's actually the average, you know, sigma overburden pressure at this layer. When we are talking about this plus this divided by two, that's actually the average here, okay? So most of the cases, actually, we try to draw that one. Then let's say this is area one, this is area two, and this is area three. Then basically, if I take area one plus two plus three, then divided by L, that will give you give us the mean effective vertical stress. Okay. And I already talked about that. So let's move forward and see that how we can use this equation to solve some of the problems, okay? So this one is saying that a concrete pile 406 millimeter and 406 millimeter limits like 0.406 meter. And definitely this is a square concrete pile in cross section is shown in figure. Calculate the ultimate skin friction resistance by using the lambda method. Now you can say I have like two uh, layers here, okay? The first layer, CU is point is 35 kilonewton per meter square. Here, CU is 75 kilonewton per meter square. This depth is 6.1 meter. Here is 12.2 meter. So what is the weighted average of CU? So that would be this multiplied by this plus this multiplied by this divided by the total L. Right, so that's what we did. 35 into 6.1, 35 into 6.1 plus 75 into 12.2, 75 into 12.2 divided by the total length, which is 18.3. So weighted average C is 61.67. Okay. Now, I try to draw the diagram here the overburden, effective overburden pressure. So here you can see zero, here gamma H. So your gamma is 18.55, H is 6.1. So I have 113.2 kilonewton per meter square, okay? Similarly, I come here. So this one is actually these, these plus 19.24, that's the saturated unit weight because this is under the uh, water table. So you have to subtract 9.81 and then multiply it with your H. So you have 228.2 kilonewton per meter square. So what would be my average over water pressure? That would be A1 plus A2 divided by L. Now what is A1? That this is A1 that would be half into this into this, right? So half into 6.1 into 113.2, okay? That's your A1. What would be your A2? It would be this plus this divided by two multiplied by 
this distance. So 113 plus 347 divided by 2 multiplied by 12.2. And then you divide it with the total length 18.3. So we get 132.6 kilonewton per meter square. Now I know the length of the pile. Total is 6.1 plus 12.2. So total is 18.3. So my lambda is around 1.8 from the table 12.10. Okay, if you go to that table, then you will see the length of the pile and they will give you the lambda value there. Once you get that lambda value, then you just plug that one here, that PLFAV. So this one, if you replace the value of FAV, then basically you just plug this one here. And I already have all those values here. If I plug those values, I get 1,369 kilometer. Okay. Actually, we'll try to do the same problem with alpha method and beta method too. Okay. And you will see that answer would be a little bit different uh, if you follow different methods. Okay. Now let's move forward for alpha method, okay? Once again, like we are talking about the frictional resistance in clay, okay? So there is three methods, lambda method, alpha method, and beta method. We already covered the lambda method and we are talking about alpha method now. So you can see the skin resistance for clay soil can be expressed as F equal to alpha into Cu. That's actually the easiest one, okay? So Cu is the undrained shear strength. Alpha is a function of basically your average overburden pressure, your uh, undrained shear strength as well. There is a you know factor here. So it's basically also considering the overburden pressure and Cu, okay? So the value of alpha is basically given in table 12.11. That's actually the value here, Cu by Pa, and your alpha is here. If you know your Cu, Pa is the atmospheric pressure, which is basically 100 kPa or 2000 PSF, right? So, uh, so you can see this is actually like you can use this equation here, but actually this is the representation here. This is based on Tarazagi 1996, and he made the table from there. Now, the, the total frictional resistance is basically alpha Cu P L. So if you know your value of alpha, then basically you just plug that one there and you can find out your frictional resistance. Now let's see the same problem here. Here, that cross section, now they are asking to find out the ultimate skin friction resistance by alpha method, okay? So you can see that Cu1 by Pa, Cu1 is 35, Pa is 100, so this is 0.35, and Cu2 by Pa is 75 divided by 100 is 0.75. Now, if you go to that table, then basically you get alpha 1 is 0.78, and alpha 2 is 0 0.56. So that's the table we are talking about, okay? If you know this value here, let's say for 0.75, if you interpret this one, then basically you will get the value of 0.56. That's what we got here, okay? Once you know that one, then basically you can just plug that value here. We have two different layers. So this is our perimeter is not changing, so I put that one there, then L1 alpha 1 C1 plus L2 alpha 2 C2 because your alpha 1 and alpha 2 as well as your Cu and Cu1 and Cu2 is different for different layers, okay? So if you plug that value, then basically we get 
3,516 kilonewton. What we got from our, uh, let's see, uh, you can see this is significantly different, right? 1369 kilonewton, and here we got uh, almost 3,516 kilonewton, more than and almost like three times, okay? 300% is like different, but that's not unusual, okay? Now let's move forward to see beta effect, okay? So unit frictional resistance of a pile can be de determined on the basis of effective stress parameters in the clay in a remolded state. What this method is actually saying that as soon as you try to drive the pile, there are a lot of, you know, like pore water pressure will develop when the pile is trying to displace the water as well as the soil from there. But after a month, everything will be normalized again, you know, like that pore water pressure will be dissipated. So what's they are talking about that it comes back to remolded, you know, like situation like when everything is kind of uh, neutralized, means like all the pressure is dissipated, okay? So what they are saying your FA, FAV or F is basically beta into uh, overburden, effective overburden pressure. So your what is your beta? That's actually K10, this is your remolded state, okay? So P in the remolded state. Remolded means like if you take the soil, bring it in your lab, remold that one, and then run your test, okay? And try to find out what is the shear strength parameters, like your C, U, and your P of the soil, okay? That's basically the remolded thing. So P prime R is drain friction angle of remolded clay, and K is the earth pressure coefficient for normally consolidated soil. Uh, for normally consolidated soil, this one is F equal to one minus sine phi R tan phi R sigma prime. And for over consolidated soil, this one is one minus sine phi R tan phi R root over OCR into sigma overburden pressure, okay, sigma prime. Now, the total frictional resistance, again, the same equation here, you just plug the value of your F here and find out your QS. Now let's see the same example here, but how to find out your frictional resistance based on beta method, but they also gave you the normally consolidated soil has a P R prime is 20 degree, okay? So now, first of all, for first layer, because your uh, overburden pressure, average overburden pressure is gonna change. So we are just taking like two different layers separately. Now you can see here, that's the same thing I draw for my uh, lambda method. So you can see here is zero here is 113.2. So what's the average pressure here? That's basically zero plus 113.2 divided by two. So this is 56.6 kilonewton per meter square average. What's the average here? That would be these plus these divided by two. So 113.2, 228.2 divided by two. So 170.7. That's the average here, that's the average here, okay? So if I plug that value in that equation, that PL1, which is 6.1, FAV, which is basically 13.6, FAV2, that's 40.9, 40.9, so I get 945 kilonewton, which is pretty close to, uh, the lambda method values, but far, far less than your alpha method, okay? 
So many cases, actually, what we do, we try to find out the frictional resistance following all those three methods and then get the average of the three. Okay, if you are very, very conservative, then basically you have to take the lowest of the three methods. Okay, let's move forward. Group piles. We see like many times actually, rather than one pile, let's say in the abutment of a bridge, a lot of load is coming there, one pile may not be enough. So we usually use a group of piles, let's say something like this. Okay, three piles, three piles, total nine piles. And together we call that one a group. Now, when we call group means like there will be a pile cap together here. So if you apply any load here or here, this one is very rigid member. So this one will you know, try to effect like same load on all of them. Okay, that's basically group piles. Now, the pile cap, many cases we see that this one would be you know this is just top of the surface of the soil here many times we see this one is far above than that for water line let's say here water table here we can also see this one is well above from the ground here is your ground then you have soil then basically here is your pile group Okay, because let's say this one is the abutment of a bridge. So this one has to be above not only the soil, but also the water level, right? So if you see this figure here, then the distance between center to center distance between two piles, we call that one lowercase d. And actually the diameter is of the pile, that's the uppercase d. And if you see, this is basically your pile cap here. So if you see from here to here, the end of this pile to end of this pile, that we call that one B, G, and this one is basically L, G. Here is, it looks like a square, so B, G is actually L, G here. Otherwise, L, G would be always bigger than your B, G, okay? Now let's move forward here. The group capacity of a pile. So what we do, basically we try to first find out the pile capacity of one pile, okay? And then if, if I have, let's say nine piles, then I'll just multiply the capacity with nine and try to find out the capacity of the pile. That's the first, okay, the step. Now I'll just talk about that step by step. But before I go there, you can also see like, let's say they are working as a group, means like the pile is kind of LGBG, the big one pile, okay? So it's which is very thick, LG and BG, depends on the center to center distance. And then we try to find out the capacity of this big pile. And then we try to see which one is the lower of the two, okay? So that's what I'm trying to show you here that first step one, so determine the individual capacity of a single pile and then multiply it with the total number of piles. So total number of piles is N1 into N2, N1 is what side in the, this is like, you can see this is N1 and N2. N1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is N1. 1, 2, 3, that's N2. So 3 into 5, that is total 15 piles here, okay? And this is basically your tip resistance, 9 APCU, that's Mayer-Hubbs method. And then you also find out actually your, uh, uh, frictional force here too, okay? So this one is actually using alpha method. This one should be alpha here, alpha C U P del L. So once you find out this one, and this is your summation of Q U, 
Now, the second part, now we assume the pile in the group act as a block with dimension L, G, B, G, and L, okay? So L is the length here. This is your L, G, bigger part, and this is your B, G, the smaller side, okay? This is a rectangle now. These are 15 different piles here, but we are thinking the whole thing is working as a block, a big block, okay? So now we have to find out the, the skin resistance of the block, which is again like FAV. Um, you can just see you del L, you can just use any of the method that you want to follow. Um, doesn't have to follow this method here. You can just follow any method and then calculate the bearing capacity, which is uh, APQP, which is AP9, actually NC star. We don't use nine anymore for this block. Actually for NC, there is another chart here that will provide you this one, you know, in which I'm gonna show that one in the next page, okay? Once you get this one here, then you just add these two, like this one and this one, then, then basically your ultimate load bearing capacity would be here in this equation. And then compare the values obtained from a step one and a step two, the lower of the two values of summation of QU is your ultimate bearing capacity, okay? And that's the variation of a NC star with LGBG and L by BG value. If you know your L by BG and this is your LG by BG, L is the length. LG is the cross-sectional, you know, like, width actually, okay? The maximum side of the cross section. And BG is the smaller size of the cross section. L is the total length of the pile here, okay? Now group efficiency. When the pile are placed close to each other, a reasonable assumption is that the stresses transmitted by the pile to the soil will overlap and reduce the load bearing capacity of the piles. So you can see this one is this one. If they are close enough, then basically the surface here is interfering to each other like the failure surface. So you will see if you keep that one little away, you will have more capacity than when you put them together, okay? So if you know exactly the distance from the two piles that are working separately, then basically your efficiency would be 100% or one. So your group efficiency that actually the value from zero to one, okay? One has the highest and zero is the lowest value, but it cannot be zero anytime it will just vary, let's say 0 0.6 to one, okay? Now, ideally the pile in a group shall be spaced so that the load bearing capacity of the group is not less than the sum of the bearing capacity of the individual pile, okay? So you have to be place that one in such a distance that um, the total capacity of the pile should be equal to the bearing capacity of some of the bearing capacity of individual piles. But many cases, if you think like, let's say I have to use like nine piles in a, um, under the pier of a bridge, then basically I may not have enough space to put all of them to a, in a certain distance. So we might have to you know, make the that one close a little bit. And once you do that one, then basically you will see your efficiency will go a little less, okay? So the minimum center to center pile spacing D is usually 2.5 times of the diameter of the pile. 
an ordinary situation. That's the minimum center distance is 2.5 D. And normal situation, it's actually about 3 to 3.5 of the diameter of the piles. Okay. And the efficiency of the load bearing capacity of a group piles may be defined as the group capacity divided by the summation of QU means like summation of sum of the load bearing capacity of a individual pile. Okay. So you can see this is the group ultimate group capacity of the pile, which is actually lower of the two values. Which two values? First value is when you just find out the capacity of one pile and multiply it, multiply with the number of the total piles. Okay. And what is the second one? You just think like the whole thing is actually working like a block. Okay. So you just try to get the lower of the two. So that's basically this one. And that's, again, this one is actually the summation of the total or multiplication of the total number of piles into the individual capacity of one pile, okay? So your group efficiency will vary from, let's say zero to one. One is the highest, okay? Now there are several equations to find out the group efficiency of friction pile, which are given below. This is for friction piles, okay? Friction piles, efficiency of friction piles. And there are several people, you know, like proposed different relationship here. You can use that one uh, to find out the group efficiency. Otherwise you can just use this equation here. Okay, to find out your group efficiency. So this is an example. This one is saying the plan of a group pile is shown in figure here. The pile are embedded in a saturated homogeneous clay with a CU equal to 860 pound per feet square given center to center distance of the pile is 30 inch, length of the pile is 45, 45 feet, diameter of the pile is 12 inch, and a factor of safety of three. Determine the allowable load carrying capacity and the group efficiency of the pile. Okay, so first of all, we have to find out the, uh, find out the load carrying capacity of the group, okay? So what we do, first step is, let's assume that the piles are acting individually, okay? And then from the equation, you can just see N1, N2. So N1 total is nine, three into three. And this is your tip resistance. And this is basically your frictional resistance. This is the alpha method, alpha C U P L. Okay, your F A V equal to alpha C U. And then multiply with P L, that's giving you the frictional resistance. So from C U by P A, that's for the alpha method, you get like 860 by 2000, that's actually 43. Now from the table, you get alpha equal to 0.72 and then you know all of them here, okay? What is the AP here? That's the area of a single pile at the tip, okay? So which is uh, basically here, gamma b squared by four, okay? So that's what they are trying to do here, area, pi b squared by four, and this is the total number of piles here, actually nine into nine, three into three, nine, and then this nine is here. This is the area on the tip of one pile, and then CU is 860, 
then you just get this one alpha is 0 0.72 then this is the perimeter and then this is actually your cu and this is the length so if you get that one you get like 800 for 800 let's say 43 keep here now the second part you just try the whole thing like a block okay so let's go there now you can see your total you know like as a group you can see lgbg that's the area of the block into c u p and c star you have to find out that nc star from the chart from the figure given there and then then basically this is your frictional coefficient here okay so your lg and BG, that's actually same here, which is actually six feet. Because if you go back here, then you can see the center to center distance is 30 inch. So you can see from here to here is 30 inch, from here to here is 30 inch. So total is 60 inch plus one diameter. That's actually 12 inch because half diameter this side, half diameter this side. So total is basically 72 that's actually six feet okay now lg by bg equal to one l by bg equal to 45 by 6 7.5 so you just go to that equation go to that figure 12.55 and find out your nc which is actually nine here so you just plug all those values here and find out where the these piles are acting as a group so you this one is 1207 so now i have to take the lower of the two so basically the pile act individually controls the situation which is 842 if you want to find out the allowable capacity then you have to divide that one with the factor of safety and you get around 281 key. okay now for group efficiency this one is the group capacity divided by the total number multiplied the, the individual capacity of a pile. So if you see that one, then basically your, your efficiency is, this one is basically, this one here, 842 is the, 842, that's actually the capacity of the pile divided by no, you know, like the total capacity considering uh, individual pile, then basically that's also 842. So basically your group efficiency is one here, okay? Now, if you think about like, if you increase that distance between the piles, actually your efficiency will remain one. But if you try to shrink that one, then basically you will see that your efficiency might go less than one, okay? Now here, elastic settlement of group piles. So basically uh, there are several methods there, but the most important and simplistic relationship is here given by VASIC, which is showing here and then you can see in that equation this is basically your elastic settlement of group piles is equal to bg width of the group pile section okay divided by the width of the diameter of each pile and ac is the elastic settlement of each pile at comparable working row okay so if you know the settlement of each of the pile then basically group pile would be root over bg by d into se okay you will see example in your book now how do you find out your sge based on the empirical relationship given by Meyerhoff? The other one was basics method. This one is Meyerhoff's method. He also gave you an empirical relationship. 
which is 2q root over bgi divided by n60. This is your SPD value. So q is equal to qg divided by lg by bg. That's actually the total stress, um, total stress of the group piles. LGBG length and width of the group section, N60 average standard penetration number within the settlement, means like BG depth below the tip of the pile. So if the BG, let's say 10 feet, and the, and the length of the pile, let's say 50 feet. So you have to actually get the N60 value at a depth from 50 to BG means like 50 to 60, BG is 10, so 50 to 60 feet within that range, okay, which is a little bit difficult to get, you know, like at a high distance like that. And then your I is the influence factor, which is one minus L divided by eight BG and should be greater than or equal to 0.5. L is the length of the embedment of the piles, okay? Now let's see uh, that how we can find out the consolidation settlement of group piles. That's very, very important because that takes much longer period um, when the construction is done and you still can see uh, consolidation settlement if your structure is in clay soil, right? consolidation settlement only occurs in clay soil. Now, what are the things you have to remember here? First of all, you just estimate that the, uh, the load will, the stress distribution would be two is to one method. You can use like other equations like Bosinski equation or other thing, but this is the simplest simplest method, like the thing that like this one is propagated with a actually 30 degree angle, or uh, like two is to one, two vertical, one horizontal, okay? If you go two vertical, then one horizontal. So if you go this side, one horizontal, and this side, one horizontal, so for two feet actually, if you go two feet, then actually this one will increase one feet, one feet, also two feet in the side way, okay? Now, first of all, step one, let the depth of embedment of the pile L and the group of the subject is total load QG. Then step two, assume that the load QG is transmitted to the soil beginning at a depth of two thirds of L from the top of the pile. So you can see this is the total length from here to here of the pile. They are just assuming that distribution started two thirds of L from the top of the pile, okay? From here, actually this one started like this, okay? So if the total is L, so the distance from here to here, here is two thirds of L. Now, the load QG is spread at along the two vertical to one horizontal line from the depth line A, A prime and B, B prime at the two, two is to one line. So this is A, A prime and B, B prime, okay? Now calculate the change in your del sigma at the middle of each layer, okay? Middle of each layer, try to see that one. So what would be your change in stress because of this new load, that would be QG divided by the area here, okay? Then what is the area at the middle of this layer? Okay, so if this is L2, so this one has to be middle of the layer, has to be L2 by two, okay? So vertical distance is L2 by two. So this one has to be L2 by two, into half, this side L2 by two into half. So actually you will see this one is increasing this side as well as increasing in the other side because other side also has like, we are seeing this way right now. 
but if you see from this side that also has to increase okay so that's basically that bg plus zi lg plus zi and you will see one of the example in the book very well you know like explained and i think that you'll be able to see that one okay so once you get your del sigma prime because of the stress that's coming additional stress that coming from the piles then basically you can just use the equation here to find out your settlement for normally consolidation settlement okay you use this equation here right for over consolidated settlement you just try to check the overburden pressure at the middle of the layer plus the additional load coming from the pile whether this one is less than your pre consolidation pressure if this is less then use this equation here if it's actually greater than that then basically this one should be greater than here should be this equation that what you learn in your geodetic class okay and the total consolidation settlement is the summation of settlement for each of the layers okay i have if i go back here then you see that here actually this part little part here and then this layer and this layer all are clays so i have to find out here here and as well as a little bit here and then add them together to find out the total settlement okay that's basically you know like the the file foundations if you have any questions